What is up, my Swiftites? How we doing? Welcome to another stream of a cockabridged, a, cl a, 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 a clash, of, a clash of kings, a bridge. It's it's man. What what have we got for you today? We got we got peak Tyrion. We got Tyrion at his Tyrionist, at his most Tyriony. He's a he's an absolute Tyrion right here is what we're gonna see. He's rolling up into King's Landing with his new squad. He's sorting some shit out, right? He's all he's all on top of it. He's sorting. He's he's contending with Varys. He's contending with Cersei. He's contending and and most of all, he's contending with his own self doubt and insecurity because the greatest enemy of all sometimes is within. Uh, but before we get into uh, the meat of things, we have some exciting announcements. We have some exciting housework. Uh, welcome, Kata, Avo, Rega, Kelly, everybody else, Nafine, Steamy Cup of Josh, Hassan, Emma. Welcome all. Uh, today we're doing Tyrion wine. But the first piece of housework, the first announcement, this is an exciting announcement, actually. Uh, this, this, this is something that's been much requested. People have been asking since the dawn of Swift. Swift, why haven't you got a podcast feed? A Clash of Kings abridged, Game of Thrones abridged is is it's an audio show, basically. There's not a whole lot happening visually. There's no like face cam, uh, unless you unless you watch really closely, like sometimes in the corner it actually flashes up, little Easter egg. Uh but but there's not a lot going on visually in this show. So like why isn't it in a podcast feed so that you can listen uh, to your heart's content anywhere, anytime, pop in your earbuds when you're commuting, like go go when you're doing the train, uh, go, you know, when you're lifting your fucking mad gains at the gym, when you're fucking skiing, when you're fucking uh, uh, base jumping, whatever it is that you do, you can hands-free swift at all times, at any time, uh, and I think... That's exciting. And so the way to do it, there's a URL in the description of this stream. It's a podcast feed. You plug that URL into any kind of podcast software, and it'll automatically download all the new Swift episodes for you that you can listen to whenever you want. Um, uh, if you're not sure about how to do that, uh, Pocket Casts is a pretty good uh, uh, phone app and web browser thing. Uh, that'll handle all your podcasts for you, but there's a million free ways to listen to podcasts, uh, so I recommend doing that. Uh, man, th ugh. see, widgets are such a fucking pain, man, because I, I like to have that little, there's a little counter you can get in the, uh, in the top left of the stream that shows how many people are in the stream, which is nice to know, because the weird thing about streaming is that you're essentially, like, performing for an audience, uh, but you can't see the audience. Um, it's not, I mean, you could be performing to thousands of people, as some streamers do, which is like a fucking arena-style rock show, but, like, you can't see any of the people. So it's like, so it, it's hard to get an understanding of what, what's going on, you know? So, like, um, so I'd like to get that counter working, so, like, I'm gonna be, like, really rude to the audience, and I'm just gonna, like, ramble while I try to see if I can get it to work. It's thrilling entertainment. I mean, here at Old Shift X, we're committed to really, like, tightly scripted, you know, well put together, thoughtful, like, great, high quality entertainment, uh, and sometimes that means we, we ramble over the top of, uh, technical difficulties. Uh, the other thing about streaming is that, like, you can't, it's hard to, like, test and sort your shit out in advance of actually streaming. Like, anything else, you do, like, a... You do, like, a rehearsal. You do, like, a... Um... Fucking hell. A viewer count. You, you, you do a whole test of, like, all your faculties to make sure everything's working. But with streaming, it's really hard to, like, do that until you're actually live for realsies. Uh, at which point, there's no... There's no turning back, you know? Uh, alright, we'll just hope that that works. All right, so we're doing Tyrion one, a Clash of Kings. I hope you're excited. This is all about Tyrion kicking ass, uh, which well, w which would be hard for a, for a dwarf, I suppose. It'd have to be sort of a running jump karate kick type thing if Tyrion wanted to literally kick an ass. Okay, all right, we got the number up, sixty-one people. Great, welcome all to the show. So Tyrion one begins with kind of a weird 
image, honestly. We have a description of Mandon Moore, so Mandon Moore of the Kingsguard. Um, and we're told that in the chilly white raiment of the Kingsguard, Mandon Moore looks like a corpse in a shroud. Um, like, fucking hell. That's, that's strong imagery to suggest that Mandon Moore looks dead. Um... I suppose uh, one of the meanings of that is that Mandon Moore, of course, tries to kill uh, Tyrion. Uh, so to Tyrion, he certainly represents a spectre of death in that Mandon Moore very nearly causes Tyrion's death. Uh, but isn't Tyrion also... Uh, no, it's Boros Blunt who becomes the, uh, who becomes the food taster um, uh, later on, but yeah, Man and Moore's main role in the story is to is to try to kill and fail to kill Tyrion. Uh, so perhaps his corpsiness is foreshadowing of that. Although, if you wanted to get uh, tinfoily about it, I'm sure, like undoubtedly, there are some people who believe that Mandon Moore is like a zombie or a white. Like, I guarantee, if if this description of Mandon Moore as a corpse, if that happened in some of the later books when people started getting really fucking desperate and stir crazy and started getting really like hardcore tinfoily, like. Like Mandon Moore equals the night the Knight's Queen would be like a top five theory right now. Um, there's actually lots of st stuff like that in the early books. Like most of the craziest theories rely on some of the later books because people weren't as crazy um, back back here in these early books. Anyway, so like Tyrion's role. So for context, Tyrion's role into King's Landing. Tyrion's just been through some shit lately, right? So, like, Tyrion went north uh, with King Robert, and then he went up to the wall, and he pissed off the edge of the earth, um, and and then he got abducted by Catelyn Stark at the end of the crossroads. He, he rode the high road and almost got killed by, by mountain men, and then he got locked up in the sky cells by Lysa Arryn and beaten by Maud with the truncheon. Uh, fucking truncheon uh and 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 then there's the trial of combat with brawn and like Tyrion had to use all these all these wits and wiles to like recruit some blokes to help him out like brawn was the guy who saved Tyrion, um and you know Tyrion's promising money to maud and he's fucking throwing debts left and right and it's cl classic lannister left hook like like Tyrion's going at it in book one. It's fucking great. Um, and then he rides into battle with the mountains and the clan's moon behind him. Like, crazy. Like, bam. But, but, this second book, I think, is where Tyrion really shifts into dwarf gear. Like, he really starts swinging for the fences at this point. Because, at the end of the day, let's be real, and Tyrion says as much in this chapter, um, Tyrion isn't best placed on a battlefield. That's not where Tyrion's skills lie. He's He was not shaped for the battlefield, he says. But, words, politics, scheming is what he loves and what he's good at. Of course, he's not the best uh, in the sort of hierarchy of schemers. Tyrion is well below people like Littlefinger, Varys, Bloodraven. Um, but but he absolutely is uh, a, a fairly competent sort of a schemer. And, um, and so this is when he really starts to get balls deep into the fucking politics and it's just great um he also he also gets pretty into shay which is something else we'll talk about there's a, ho a whole bunch of psychological interesting character things going on but how about instead of just talking about it we actually get into it and and and, and talk about it still oh boy um how are we doing in the chat people are subscribing to the podcast thanks mark halfman halfman yes emma uh we're speaking to the king blood raven is best uh Alex asks, is Tyrion lower than Littlefinger? The show portrayed them as almost equals. Well, I think it's pretty clear that Littlefinger runs fucking circles around Tyrion. Because Littlefinger totally frames Tyrion with the Valyrian steel blade and gets him locked up. And Tyrion never uh, gets back at Littlefinger over that. And Tyrion never understands Littlefinger's schemes. Tyrion never realizes that Littlefinger kills Jon Arryn uh, and all this stuff like that. So I, I think it's pretty clear that Littlefinger does outplay Tyrion. I think it's fair to say that Littlefinger is on a higher tier of schemers uh, than Tyrion is. Tyrion is not as informed as Littlefinger with all these like spies and stuff. Um, cool. So, uh, so Tyrion wants to go talk with the small council, uh, the big political players in King's Landing, uh, and, uh, and Mandon Moore, the Kingsguard, the corpsey dorpsey Kingsguard, doesn't want to let Tyrion in. Uh, he's saying, well, no, the, they do not want to be disturbed. Um, and Tyrion's like, oh, well, I'll only be a small disturbance, sir. Um, which... Oh, well, David in the chat says that nobody realizes that Littlefinger killed Aaron, 
I reckon Sansa knows. I reckon Sansa Stark knows. And I reckon Sansa Stark will be learning her to scheme and that she will stab Peter with his own dagger. Uh, although they did that in the show and it was lame, so who knows. All right, so, like, Manamore's like, nah, you cannot pass. You shall not pass. Manamore is having a... Gandalf moment, and Tyrion is having a sort of a self-defacing moment. I'll only be a small disturbance, sir. Uh, Tyrion makes a lot of references to how small he is, uh, of course, as a dwarf. Uh, he's not hes not a tall man, but he's very frequently making references to his short stature, um, which I think portrays a certain insecurity. Just, like, seriously, count the number of times Tyrion says, I'm, ju- I'm such a short man. It happens a lot. Um, and so uh, he's he's walking in, he's trying to get past Mandon more, and Mandon says, oh, well, Cersei does not wish to be disturbed. He repeats it again, as though Tyrion was a dullard who had not heard him, uh, Tyrion says. Which um, I think might betray another insecurity, insecurity, like Tyrion going like, oh, he's talking to me as if I was some sort of a dumbo. I wonder if Tyrion's perhaps a bit insecure about, like, his intelligence or whatever, uh, and so he's, like, hypersensitive to people questioning his uh, wits, you know? Um, Tyrion, Tyrion's trying to prove himself in this chapter is one of the big uh, themes. Uh, and, yeah, also, it's kind of funny, Tyrion says, oh, look, I need to come in here because, like, I've got a letter from my father, Lord Tywin Lannister, who is the Hand of the King. So Tyrion, so Tyrion's, like, introducing and explaining things that Mandon Moore perfectly well knows, uh, but which is truly a reminder, a little bit of exposition for the audience, because, of course, this book came, uh, this second book of Game of Thrones came out an entire two years after the first book came out, so in those, in that massive two-year gap, readers needed some reminding of what was going on in the complex story, you know? Two years is a long time between books. How could readers possibly retain all the knowledge, not to mention their enthusiasm for the story after two years? I mean, if there was a gap any longer than two years in between books of a complex fantasy story, I mean, who could... Who could possibly keep track? Who, who would care? I mean, if if you went to like five years, six years, seven years, there's no way anyone would know. All right. Um, and so uh, Tyrion does something that he, another thing that he does a lot, which is that he thinks of Jamie. Um, so Tyrion remembers that Jamie once said uh, that Mandon Moore was, was was the most dangerous of the Kingsguard, um, except for Jamie himself, because his face gave no hint as to what he might do next. There's a lot of actual, like, weird descriptions of Mandon Moore. Mandon Moore um, is described as looking really, like, strange-faced and kind of dead and pale and gross. Um, he's probably a deep one. Probably a deep one. Welcome, Gordon, to the chat. Night Paster, good name. Um, uh, all right, so uh, Mandon Moore is a corpsey boy. That's okay. Let's not discriminate against the dead. Um, because the dead have enough <laughs> enough to worry about, you know? Um, and Tyrion's thinking, well, Mandon Moore's apparently pretty dangerous, but I reckon uh, my main man Bronn, or my main man Timot, Sumner Timot, uh, could probably kill Mandon Moore, so Tyrion's not too worried. Uh, which is a nice little reminder that we are living in a situation and in a society that's, like, not so far from, like, the state of nature. Like, you know, like, 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 you know, Westeros might claim to be civilized, Westeros might claim to have laws and society, but, like, you still have to think about, if it came to fighting, could I kill you? So, like, they're sort of, like, they're, like, they're, like, they're, like, they're, like, it's high society, but they're, like, this close to, like, just stabbing each other again. We live in a very delicate uh, bubble, a, a delicate Ming vase of peace and stability, which any amount of pressure, starvation, strife could cause sudden violence, and then we're just monkeys stabbing each other with um, rocks again, and nobody wants that, except maybe for Littlefinger, what with the chaos and whatnot. Uh, And so Tyrion is, shall we say, vexed by Mandon trying to uh, prevent Tyrion passing. Tyrion does not have any patience for this Gandalf impersonation uh, because Tyrion's trying to assert his authority. He's walking into King's Landing, he stepped into the club and he wants people to know he's the fucking man in charge. He's trying to assert his authority. He wants people to respect his authority. Uh, So he's trying to swing his dick around a bit uh, and so uh, Tyrion's like, hey, uh, Mandon, uh, you know my main man uh, you know my main man Bronn 
Uh, well, he says, you know your main man, Vardis Egan, the guy at the Eerie who, who Bronn killed? And, and Manda Moore's like, yeah, no, I, I know Vardis Egan very well. Uh, and then Bronn says, well, you knew him because I killed him. <laughs> says Bronn. Uh, and so that's Tyrion's way of, um, of threatening Mandon Moore, basically. And Mandon Moore does in, indeed eventually let him pass. Uh, Alan asks if, if I, Swift, could beat up Tyrion. Uh, I reckon... I reckon I could beat Tyrion on the upper body strength, but he is much taller than me. Um, so I think Tyrion's greater stature and mass uh, might might cause him to win the day, honestly. Um, all right, so uh, we have a bit of threatening. We have a bit of masculine chest beating is basically what happens here. And Tyrion's like, i got to go talk to my sister. Uh, let me through. And so Mandon Moore does. Uh, and so Tyrion thinks, well, this is a small victory, but a sweet one. I have passed my first test. Uh, so Tyrion is really trying to... He see, he sees coming to King's Landing as an opportunity to prove himself. He wants to show his worth to his father, to the world, to his family, by showing how useful he can be in a position of power. He's he, Because, of course, Tywin has made Tyrion Hand of the King in Tywin's absence. Uh, this is this is a great opportunity to wield some power and to demonstrate his competence, and so he wants to make the most of that opportunity. Um... <laughs> Old Swift extra small. Yeah, no doubt. That should that should be um yeah. Um so Tyrion walks through and then his loving sister, his lovely uh uh older sister Cersei turns to Tyrion, sees him for the first time in like a year after all this fucking war well not a year, but after a while of like war and nonsense and craziness, Tyrion ta- uh, Cersei turns to Tyrion and says you in a tone that is equal parts disbelief and distaste. Uh, <laughs> so Cersei is no fan of Tyrion, and, and Tyrion's response to that is to say, oh, well, I can see where Joffrey learned his courtesies, uh, suggesting that the reason why Joffrey is such a nasty little uh, nasty little twat it might be because he learned it from Cersei. Um, oh, and also, like, as Tyrion strides in, he, he feels almost tall, so we have another reminder of Tyrion's insecurity over his height, and so how his attempts to prove himself and prove his power are, I think, related to his insecurity over his body. Um, so, uh, oh, and, and while Tyrion's walking in, he tries to look confident, and so he, he stops to admire a pair of Valyrian sphinxes that guard the door at the small council room, which which is interesting, isn't it? What's a couple of Valyrian sphinxes doing round here? What's a Valyrian sphinx like you doing in a place like this? You come here often? Uh, Tyrion's really, really, really undressing these Valyrian sphinxes with his eyes. But my question is, what's the significance of the Valyrian sphinx? Uh, what does it mean? The sphinx comes up later in uh, book four in relation to the character Alaras, uh, who, of course, later turns out to be Sorella Sand, or, or is implied to be Sorella Sand. Uh, and the relation there maybe being that the sphinx uh, represents like a riddle or some kind of... Uh, Oh, what do people say? It's it's a pickle wrapped in a conundrum or something. It's, it's, someone said something funny once. Not me, but someone did. Um, and a Valyrian sphinx represents, yeah, sort of sort of puzzlement and riddles. And and a sphinx also represents like a hybrid of different creatures, I think, because 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 sphinxes had uh, like a woman's face, but an eagle's uh wings but like a cat's body or something is like the mythological sphinx who like oedipus had to deal with because remember my main man oedipus uh came across a sphinx along the road and then he ended up banging his mum, and it's this whole whole fucking issue so just stay away from sphinxes Uh, some look hashtag not all sphinxes anyway uh but Tyrion's eyeing some sphinxes and it is very curious that this that this potent symbolism of, of a sphinx uh is present in the um in the small council room. David in the chat points out that, uh, oh, sorry, Hassan in the chat points out uh, that since the Targaryens built the Red Keep, it makes sense that they would have Valyrian sphinxes because the Targaryens are from Valyria and maybe they uh, are into Valyrian decor. They're into Valyrian feng shui and so they want to keep the, the chi and the chakra in the right alignment and maybe that's why they have the sphinxes. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great point, Hassan. Um, uh, Emma has a Valyrian sphinx, her cat, it must be fucking expensive to import uh, a sphinx from Valyria. The 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 the, the fucking uh, the fucking tariffs are, are very high. I've heard. 
Uh, a riddle wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in an enigma, says Avo. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get at, I think. Um, conspiracy theory, Oldstrift has a major in classics, and that's why he knows so much about Greek mythos. Man, I, I didn't study Greek mythos. I was there. I thought I thought you knew. Swift is an aged individual. I, 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 was, I was there. I was hanging out with Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. I taught them everything they knew. Honestly, Aristotle, he was this snotty little, snotty little 12-year-old going, Hey, Mr. Swift, what's the deal with the, with the means of, of the virtues? And do you think maybe it, the, there's four elements or is, is the, or is the earth round? And I taught him everything he knew. And that's why we've got philosophy. I mean, not to toot my own horn. Uh, philosophy was named after me. My real name is Phil. Uh, there you go. Name reveal. Um... So, yeah, since the days of Hello Rocks. Uh, anyway, no tangents. On the tracks. Uh, so, in a very short period of time, unlike that uh, uh, ramble, George Martin's prose in this page, I think, is especially efficient. Like, he really does something specific with, like, every specific sentence. Like, we have Tyrion... We, we have... Tyrion walking into the room feeling almost tall. So we have Tyrion trying to assert his power and his insecurities. And then in the next sentence, we have Cersei turning to Tyrion and saying, you, with with distaste, which reminds us of the strained relationship between uh, Tyrion and Cersei. Uh, And then the next sentence, we have Tyrion saying, oh, well, it's because you're you're so rude that Joffrey is so awful. So that's the next thing. And then you have these Valyrian sphinxes without another imagery. Like, every sentence is really like a specific, pointy, like, dan... like, like Like, the text is so charged and, and fucking bristling. I haven't got the words, but it's it, it's to the point, unlike Swift. Um, and, and that sounds in stark contrast, I think, to some of the later books in A Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, we're not going to get in the on the train of, of, of shooting all over George Martin's later books, but um, compare these Tyrion chapters to the dance Tyrion chapters, which are literally like, Tyrion got on a boat and felt really sad. And here's an entire paragraph about the history of the Roynar. Will it ever be relevant? Maybe. Here's Yandri. Here's a character you'll really enjoy. Yandri. I'm sure Yandri is a really memorable character who's going to be really important later on. Oh, now Tyrion's thinking about where whores go. Does this mean anything? Well, it means he's sort of longing and tortured. Ah, here's Tyrion being depressed. Three chapters later. Ah, Ty- Tyrion is still depressed. Depression update. Tyrion continues to be depressed. Thanks for the update. Like, Jesus Christ, some of the dance chapters are hard to read. Like, it's literally him on a boat. Dwarf on a boat. Uh, one dwarf and, and one boat. Look, it, it's just... It's just... It's a bit different. Um, so, Nosekills uh, makes a kind donation. Thank you, Nosekills, and says he was going to leave the office, but then the stream started. He'll go home to watch the rest of it later. Well, Nosekills... You can, if you choose, listen to this show in podcast form. It's so convenient. Because uh, of those of us who don't have YouTube Red or whatever, it, like, you can't really listen to something like this in your pocket unless you've got YouTube Red because because it has, like, the video feed and then, like, your pocket accidentally, like, butt dials like your boss and then, like, you've got your boss listening to Alt Drift X and it's, it's all downhill from there. Uh, Homo sapiens liked Tyrion in A Dance with Dragons. Well, look, I think I think there's interesting things going for it. Uh, but my only point that I'm trying to make is that concise, it is not. Uh, unlike in here. So, uh, Cersei has lovely green eyes, but she looks at Tyrion without the least hint of affection. There's this deep juxtaposition in Cersei Lannister between her beauty, which radiates, you know, positivity and attraction, and which is conventionally associated with virtue and good people. Uh, that is compared to her cruel, cold actions, increasingly. So, uh, Tyrion saunters over to the table. I'd love to see a dwarf saunter. I imagine that might be a little... Um, tricky, um, but he uh, and then Varys is there at the small council, and he takes the letter that Tyrion's passing, and he turns it in his delicate, powdered hands, and and Varys says, "Hey, oh, look, the the seal is such a lovely shade of gold." Um, t- Varys Varys talks a lot of like, um, I think I think a lot of what Varys tries to do is he tries to disarm people. He's constantly trying to convince people that he's not a threat. Varys is always giving Ew, I d- d- titter, 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 here's a little fact about something irrelevant. And so Varys is always trying to like convince people that I, I mean no harm, I'm just a, I'm just an effeminate bald man with no cock. You need not fear me. 
I'm just going to feed you helpful whispers. Uh, when, of course, in actuality, Varys is like a stone-cold motherfucker who's just manipulating whole continents uh, for the sake of his political aims. Uh, 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 we, we, don't, we don't say good things about uh, a, a certain YouTube channel called Old Shift X around here, but but got to admit, there is a pretty good video about Varys on that particular channel, which you might want to check out if you're into that. <coughs> Sneeze. Uh, so Varus is taking the letter, and the letter says that uh, Tywin wants Tyrion to be the uh, standing hand of the king in Tywin's absence. Uh, Marcus asks, what did you miss? Pretty much you've missed uh, Tyrion walking into a room. That's about what we've covered uh, in the last 27 minutes of streaming, uh, so maybe we should pick up the pace slightly. Uh, thank you, Carter. Uh, so, uh, bless up, Avo says. I haven't heard that one before. Uh, Gesundheit's a good one. All right. Um, uh, Kenny Arnold says, Old Chief Dex is fake news. Uh, truth. Uh, so Varus is hanging about, and, um, and Tyrion notes that, uh, that his sister Cersei is sitting in the king's seat at the small, at the small council, because just as, uh, Tyrion in this chapter is trying to assert his power, uh, Cersei is trying to assert her power all day, every day, 24-7. Uh, Cersei is constantly clawing for power, uh, and she feels that she's constantly being denied, uh, the, the power that she deserves, which is one of the engines of tension and, and need that drives her whole arc and her character. Um, uh, and Joffrey does not bother to turn up at small council meetings, just like King Robert didn't bother to turn up at small council meetings. So maybe you could say that's a bit of nurture over nature, right? Like, the relationship between Robert at Baratheon and his, his supposed son, Joffrey, is a pretty interesting one. Like, supposedly the reason why Joffrey killed Bran was to impress Robert in some misguided way, which is interesting. Um, and it's interesting to think about what sort of influence Robert had on Joffrey. Um, and maybe you could say the fact that Joffrey doesn't bother to turn up at meetings is maybe partly because uh, he learned from Robert not to turn up at meetings. Um, but, on the other hand, uh, consider that J uh, Joffrey's real father, Jaime, is not known for his patience when it comes to politics. My guess would be that if Jamie Lannister was king, <coughs> oh boy, burp and a sneeze, we're in for a good one tonight. Uh, if Jamie was king, I don't reckon he'd bother to turn up at meetings either, I dare say. Jamie is not very interested in politics, so maybe it is nature rather than nurture. Nature, nurture. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. 111 people watching. Cool. Welcome all. Um, so, the Queen says this is absurd. This is absurd, the Queen says. She sounds like Queen Victoria. No, she doesn't. Uh, so, uh, Cersei is not happy that Tyrion has been named Acting Hand of the King, uh, because, uh, she would prefer Tywin. Uh, because Cersei actually respects and admires Tywin, and constantly wants his approval, uh, whereas, uh, she sees Tyrion as a obstacle, if not a straight-up danger, because, of course, remember that, uh, Cersei believes that Tyrion is the fulfillment of the Valenqua prophecy which will kill her children, uh, uh, which which leads to much more serious conflict later on. But but at this point in the story, Cersei and Tyrion are not that uh, mad at each other just yet. Their relationships actually like I mean they obviously don't like each other at all. Um, but there's some there's some decency between them at this point in the story. So it's interesting to see to see how their relationship deteriorates over the following book or two. Um, so we'll. Um, so we'll talk more about that later. Uh, thank you for the donation, N. Gibbon. Uh, and he is keen on... Uh, they are keen on burps and sneezes. Well, if that's what it takes, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Grandmaster Pycelle is also at the Ground Council meeting. Uh, and he nods ponderously. And mine got... Pycelle does everything ponderously. Uh, uh, he, he, he does everything ponderously. He is a ponderous, ponderous man. Ponderous means, like, moving, like, slowly and sort of steadily. It, uh, ponderousness is often associated with very sort of large objects, I think. Like, if you maybe put, like, a little feet on a giant heavy train carriage full of lead... I think it would move ponderously if such a thing were to happen. And a, a, a very obese elephant would move 
ponder can elephants be obese or are they like obese by default what would how fat can an elephant get oh have you guys seen there was this one time someone hanged an elephant it's really fucked up like an elephant killed someone and so some nang decided that all right we've got a We've got to try this elephant in a court of law uh, because we've accused this elephant of murder. And the murder was, and the elephant was found guilty of the murder. And the elephant was sentenced to death by hanging. And there's a photo of, of, an, of an elephant hanged by a chain around the neck, hanged from a crane, like a huge crane that's holding it's awful it's it's terrible it's sad it's a hell of an image though if you if you want to feel really sad sometime uh google that up because it's it's a thing um i i i yeah i don't know i don't even know what to say about that but it's a thing um it was hanged and it was probably hanged um ponderously uh, I, was, well, I was trying to make a fun point about the fact that Pycelle does everything ponderously count the number of times Pycelle things does things ponderously in this um, book. Uh, and Janos Slint is also at the small council meeting, uh, which, 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 let's be real. Do you, do you ever get a bit of a, one of these things is not like the other moment, uh, on the small council? Like, on this council, you've, you've got a meeting of some of the most politically competent and powerful and smart people in Westeros. Uh, fucking L- Littlefinger, Varys, the puppet master, uh, Tyrion, the, the, the fairly competent, Cersei, the, well, questionably competent, but certainly an active, active, uh, force of, of politics and power. Uh, and then you've got Janos bloody Slint, jowly, balding Janos Slint, who Tyrion notes has gotten rather above himself. He looks like a smug frog. So Tyrion, of course, immediately hates Janos, uh, which on the one hand is fair enough, because let's be real, Janos is uh, pr- a pretty gross, uh, treacherous, uh, immoral, amoral sort of a person. Um... Uh, so it's so it's fair enough to hate him on that respect, but I think but it's quite clear that part of the reason why Tyrion uh, doesn't like Janos is because Janos is Janos is an example of social mobility. He started out as like a peasant, uh, but now Janos uh, is on the small council and he's actually become the Lord of Harrenhal after his role in the coup against like Eddard Stark. Uh, and Tyrion resents Janos Slint and his social mobility, which is which is not. It's not it's not something that's consistent with our modern values now, is it? Uh, it's funny how people always think of Tyrion as like a good guy, and suddenly in the show, Tyrion is is a paragon of moral virtue. So often, uh, which I don't think in the books he is at all. Uh, but but yeah, it's it's interesting seeing Tyrion looking down on social mobility like this. When 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 Tyrion in 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 other senses is like a champion of the cripples and the bastards and the broken things. Tyrion is a champion of the downtrodden in some respects, uh, but certainly not in this respect. Uh, thank you for the donation, YouTube Underground, who says that if the chat reaches $100 in donations, he'll get a Hello Rock tattoo. What would a Hello Rock tattoo look like? I mean, I- I'm struggling to imagine a design of a rock that, like, looks good. I mean, maybe you could have, like, 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 a, like a stone, and then you'd have, like, a banner across the stone that says, like, hello, or, like, carved into the stone. I don't know. I'd be fascinated to see those designs, but, uh, thank you kindly, YouTube Underground. And if you do get the tattoo, uh, I recommend face or butt cheeks. Just one or the other. Go hard. All right. Um, so, uh, Janos Slint is here, uh, and Janos Slint is complaining that uh, Westeros is in a hard time. There's rebellion everywhere. There's this grim red comet in the sky. There's rioting in the city streets. And then Cersei says, well, that's your bloody problem, mate. Your job as as commander of the City Watch is to manage this shit. Um so, so Janos stepped in that one, let's be honest. If you're in charge of public order, don't walk into the important meeting saying uh, everything's messed up. That's like being, um, that's like turning up at, um, that's like being the, 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 the timekeeper uh, and, and walking into the room and saying, sorry, I'm late. Well, no, it's not really like that. Anyway, so Cersei looks at Tyrion and says, Tyrion, and you shouldn't bloody turn up here either because uh because you should be on the field of battle you'd be more useful there which is really just Cersei saying I'd rather you were somewhere far away hopefully getting killed is what Cersei really means by that I think uh but Tyrion's like no 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 mate 
Nah, mate. I don't belong on the battlefield. I am done with fields of battle. I sit a chair better than a horse. I hold a wine goblet better than a battle axe. And he talks about, well, you know, people talk about war as like this glorious thing. The thunder of the drums. The magnificent destrier horses. Uh, but Tyrion says, the drums give me headaches. And the magnificent destriers shit everywhere. So part of the point of uh, this chapter and in, well, the series generally is about deconstructing like the mythologization and like the um, fantasy, positive, chivalrous, glamorous notions of what violence and warfare means, uh, Tyrion has found that quite the opposite is true. And that's a message that's hammered home over and over throughout this series, especially in Feast. War, in reality, is ugly. Um, so, uh, Tyrion's done with battles. He would rather sit and drink and talk smack. Wouldn't we all? Um, so, uh, and he also says that, um, he also says that, uh, but the battle was nothing compared to his hospitality in the Vale of Arryn. Tyrion did not enjoy the sky cells one bit. And Littlefinger laughs at Tyrion's paragraph of shit talking and says, well said, Lannister, a man after my own heart. Uh, which is interesting praise. There are some similarities between Littlefinger and, Tyr Littlefinger and Tyrion, aren't there? Because Littlefinger is someone who I think feels resentful of a society who has looked down on him, and I think part of what Littlefinger's sort of um, Spongebob Plankton-esque uh, supervillain MF Doom sort of feel, I think part of his vibe comes from he, he resents society and so he wants to punish society. I think that's a lot of what Littlefinger is all about. He wants to inflict chaos and damnation upon the world that didn't see him for the important man he is. Oh, the girl didn't kiss him so he wants to destroy the world. Like it's uh, that's sort of his deal, I think. And I think Tyrion is quite similar. Tyrion feels very resentful of a world that has punished him for being a dwarf, and he feels insecure about his power. Tyrion is always thinking about how small and little he is, just as Littlefinger is very uh, conscious of how of how little he is and how that has affected him in like his duel with Bran and Stark and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, I think I think there legitimately are similarities between Tyrion and Littlefinger, both men who use intrigue and politics instead of raw power to, to defeat their enemies. Um, so there are similarities, but of course, uh, they are, uh, shall we say, opposed lately, uh, because uh, Littlefinger, of course, framed Tyrion with this Valyrian steel uh, knife, framed him for the attempted murder of Bran Stark and indeed John Arryn, which caused Tyrion to be locked up and all of that stuff, and Tyrion is conscious of this. Um, because the whole story was that the, 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 the blade came from Littlefinger. And so Tyrion looks at Littlefinger and says, eh, I think we're going to have to have a little chat, Peter, Tyrion thinks. Uh, he wants to sort out what happened with this blade, uh, what the nature of Peter, Peter's betrayal is, um, and, um, and he wants to sort that out, which is something that never happens. Tyrion never actually confronts Littlefinger over his framing of Tyrion and the Valyrian Steel Knife, which is weird. George Martin must have been planning to do that at some point, because he mentions it twice in this chapter, but it never actually ends up happening. Emma feels bad for Peter sometimes. I, I think my sympathy for Peter ends where Peter's uh, murder and systematic destabilization of an entire country begins. I, 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 it, it, like, we can and should feel sympathy for Peter and, like, the way he's being treated badly. Um, but, I mean, there are a lot of people in A Song of Ice and Fire who are treated much worse, and none of those people try to burn down the world. So, you know, let's not be too sympathetic of Peter, perhaps. Um... Uh, alright. Tubbs says hello and goodbye. Well, hello and goodbye to Tubbs Tubbs. Um, so... Tyrion and Littlefinger have a chat. Uh, Tyrion brought a few hundred men to King's Landing, mostly his mountain clansmen. Uh, and Cersei is anxious about, uh, Renly and Stannis Baratheon, who are raising armies and might prove a threat to the Lannister regime at King's Landing. Um, and... Uh, and Cersei says, well, this is bullshit... Anyway, like, the king gets to decide who's handed the king, and the king chose Tywin Lannister to be hand of the king. And Tyrion's like, well, Tywin chose me to be hand of the king after Joffrey chose Tyrion, so by extension of, of delegation of, of, of the chain, uh, therefore I am hand of the king. Which, which raises the question, does that mean that Tyrion can choose who the acting hand is? Like, like if, if, if Joffrey chooses Tywin and Tywin chooses Tyrion, could Ty Tyrion choose, say... 
Timmet, son of Timmet. I reckon Timmet, son of Timmet, would be a great hand of the king. And if, you know, he needs to go away or do something else, Timmet, son of Timmet, could choose Lomi Greenhands to be his acting hand of the king. Like, how far can this delegation stream down? If, if, if Lomi chooses Old Nan, and Old Nan chooses Nimble Dick Crab, and then Nimble Dick Crab chooses Tywin, and then the whole delegation cycle starts all over. That, just infinity loop, divide by zero, universe, poof explodes. That, that is what would happen if Tyrion chose Timmet, son of Timmet. Uh, Hadass says, plug the plosives. Ah, yeah, no, that's true. We should have the mic a little bit further back and aim the, the face hole slightly differently and turn up the gain in OBS a bit. Uh, and maybe this will be a bit better on the plosives. If, I f if, if there's something wrong with the stream, please do yell at me and I'll try and fix it. Uh, Lomi Green... Uh, <laughs> infinite hands, Isaac says. Uh, someone asks whether um, there should be two hands of the king, uh, and Gibbon asks, which w you'd think that would make sense. Uh, they say that many light hands make light work, um, and most people do have green hands. Um, so, I mean, hey, it adds up. Um, Flemant Braxxxxxx, um, was once in a band called Hand Delegation Circle. Was that like a folk, I'm imagining like a really cute, like, sort of like retro, like hipster folk band called Hand Delegation Circle. I'm imagining ukuleles, I'm imagining some like King of Carrot Flowers sort of shit. That would be nice. I'd enjoy that. Um, oh, Hades was not talking about plosives. Well, who knows, oh, Peter Project plosives, right. Fuck, whatever. All right, so. Let's turn a page. Uh, so Varus slithers to his feet, smiling in an unctuous way. Uh, so Varus, uh, so at the same time that Varus always has this vibe of like, oh, I'm just this innocent sort of, you know, flowery, effeminate sort of totally harmless individual. Um, at the same time, he's slithery, he's unctuous, he's like a snail or a slug or a snake um, and is therefore not to be trusted. Um, oh, Vera says, you must have yearned for the sound of your sweet sister's voice. Uh, and the other uh, m people at the meeting excuse themselves so that uh, Tyrion and Cersei can speak alone. Tyrion says, well, Vera says, very well, we'll leave you siblings to speak to each other, Cersei and Tyrion. Uh, the woes of our troubled realm shall keep. It's more important that you two get some sibling bonding time together. Uh, which I think is actually subtly Varys talking some mad shit. Because um, when Varys says, oh, well, yeah, you guys take your time to have your chat. The woes of our troubled realm shall keep. Uh, Varys, of course, means the absolute opposite. Varys is, al Varys is always going on about how he cares about the realm. He cares about the little children. He thinks that the problems of the country are really important and that's what everyone should focus on um which which and so of course Varys doesn't think it's more important for Tyrion and Cersei to have some sibling time um he thinks that it's really important uh, uh, man I'm really laboring this point but I, I think that is the case that Varys is actually subtly um uh making his point about the realm uh, Varys is such a diva for the realm, Ra says, uh, which which he really is, which of course is actually kind of bullshit with Varys, isn't it? Because the whole thing about Varys is that he's always going on about how like, oh, I'm doing it for the greater good, man, I'm doing it for the realm, man, when in actual fact Varys is orchestrating war in order to install a fake Targaryen, uh, which might actually be for more personal reasons as opposed to sort of utilitarian uh, good noble reasons because it may be that uh, Varys and Illyrio have a sort of a Blackfire connection with young Griff. Again, go and watch the Varys uh, video by the imposter of Shift X. But um, there's 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 Varys is complicated. Varys is such a good character. Uh, Kathy asks, what if Vin Diesel had played Varys? That I could get behind. I I would love ripped Varys. <laughs> I I would love a Varys who can like. He can drop the unctuous smile, but then he can just he can just fucking like pick up Gregor Clegane and swing him around by his ankles. That would be entertaining. Um, all right, so uh, the fast and the Verizius, yeah, right. Uh, and so they they walk out, and um, 
And Janos mentions, oh, I can get you a room. Oh, Littlefinger says to Tyrion, I can get you chambers in Magor's Holdfast if you'd like. Uh, but Tyrion says, no, no, thank you. I'll be staying in the Tower of the Hand, Lord Stark's former quarters. And Littlefinger laughs and says, mate, you know what happened to the last person who stayed uh, in the uh, Tower of the Hand? They fucking died, mate. Uh, uh, Eddard Stark fucking died. Uh, and the guy behind that... Uh, the, the the person before that to live in the Tower of the Hand, John Aaron, he also fucking died. Um, so it seems an ill-omened position. It's like the defense against the dark arts position in Hogwarts and Harry Potter, right? It's it's an ill-omened position to fill because something bad seems to happen to all of these people. Um, <laughs> Brandon asks if Varys is even a eunuch. Do you think he's just been like he's he's done the old sort of tuck tuck and bind technique? He sort of he sort of s- f- squirreled his his gonads away for later use. Maybe may, may maybe maybe like Davos, uh, uh, Varys has a little pouch that he keeps his genitalia in uh, for uh, later use if he needs them. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so they talk about how like the hands of the king. Um, has has been a bad position so, because not only has Eddard Stark uh, lost his head, uh, but before that, John Aaron was poisoned, and before that, uh, Aerys Targaryen's hand, Rossart, was the hand for a fortnight until he was killed by Jaime. Before that, Carlton Chested was the hand of the king, and he got burned to death by Aerys. And before that, John Connington was hand of the king, and he got like exiled for failing to like beat Robert uh, Robert Baratheon at the Battle of the Bells or something like that. So yeah, hand of the king, not a great, not great job security. Uh, the benefits probably good. The pay probably great. Uh, hand of the king looks good on the resume. Uh, but not great for life expectancy. Would not recommend. Um, so the, uh, so Varys is talking shit. Littlefinger's talking about being Hand of the King. Um, and, uh, Tyrion has another thought about threatening Littlefinger over the whole knife issue. Tyr- uh, Tyrion makes another comment about being small. Uh, and, uh, Cersei complains about all this talk of history about all these past hands of the king. Um, I I hope Father did not send you here to plague us with history lessons, because Cersei has very little patience for learning about the past, which, of course, is one of her great failures, because if Cersei knew a bit more about history, she might have known about what happened last time the crown empowered the faith to arm the swords and stars, the, the sparrows who end up sending Cersei on a walk of shame and undermining her power. So maybe Cersei should have listened more to history. Um, Emma suggests that Varys has a five-foot dick, and that's why he looks like he's floating. So is it like a prehensile dick that he can sort of slither around on, like some kind of snake man creature? That would probably be quite uncomfortable. Uh, Hassan says that John Con is a dumbass for not ending the war, trying to prove himself. Well, you reckon John Con should have stuck around and, and uh, tried to beat Robert? That might have ended worse uh, for Robert, I suspect. <coughs> a chew. Um, so that happens. Uh, and then Tyrion and Cersei have a nice little heart to heart. Um, and so Cersei is mad that Tyrion's been uh, made Hand of the King without her approval. Cersei hates it when people work around her power, undermine her power. Um, and. Uh, and and she's frustrated by that, and Tyrion's like, well, Tywin can ignore your likes, uh, because Tywin has a very large army, and people who have very large armies can do whatever they like. Might equals right, mate. Um, uh, David says something in Russian. Does that is that like the Russian equivalent of Gesundheit? How, how many different languages have words for Gesundheit? And what does Gesundheit even mean? Uh, man, I don't know. Alright, so, uh, Cersei is mad about her power being undermined, just like Tyrion. She's trying to prove herself. Uh, and, um... And they talk about how Tywin is essentially the source of Tyrion's authority. And sort of the reason why Tyrion isn't too scared of Cersei, uh, fucking him up is because uh, Tyrion knows that he has the backing of Tywin uh, in this position, which uh, which is kind of a funny thing for Tywin to be the source of Tyrion's power and his support, given that Tyrion ends up 
killing Tywin, and they don't exactly have the best relationship. It is a very uh, tenuous, unsteady alliance at best. Uh, Enigma Zero Zero says Troy and Arbed in the morning. I don't understand the con- the connection or the context, but I approve of the message. Um, Isaac is going to go and eat. Have a good meal. See, one of the other benefits of having a podcast feed is that you can eat and listen to Alt Shift X seamlessly, easily, while while you're chewing, while you're having your chews, while you're eating your burritos with your beetroot in it. You can listen to Old Shift Podcast Feed. The podcast feed is in the top of the description if you'd like to subscribe to the official Old Shift Text Podcast. Um, So, Tyrion talks about how, well, what you really care about, Cersei, I know what you care about, it's Jaime. Uh, Because right now, Jaime is, of course, captured by the Starks after the Battle of the Whispering Wood, and Cersei wants uh, her lover and her twin Back. And Tyrion reminds Cersei that Jaime is is Tyrion's brother just as much as it, as he is Cersei's brother. Uh, Jaime, oh, that's a sound. Uh, Jaime is an interesting sort of like intermediary between Cersei and Tyrion, I think, because um, Tyrion and Cersei hate each other. They're so, sort of one of the few things that link them together, um, and um, and keep them not like murdering each other on the spot is the fact that they have mutual love for Jaime. Uh, if Jaime didn't exist, I think Cersei and Tyrion would have a much more strained uh, relationship. Hadass is not only cooking, but also writing a paper while listening. I, how do you have that many hands, let alone that, that many brains? How... How... <laughs> yeah, someone heard that Windows <laughs> booting sound in the background. I don't know why that happened. All right, anyway. Um, so, uh, so Jamie, uh, and uh, they go over the political situation, how the Lannisters had Eddard Stark, and they had Sansa, and they had Arya, but uh, they cut off Eddard's head, and Arya ran away, so they only have a third of the number of Starks uh, they had before. Uh, so the Lannisters are in a less powerful political situation than they could have been if they managed their shit properly. Uh, and they des- uh, yeah, and they describe how uh, Arya... They, they didn't man- manage to capture Arya because of the interference of the wretched dancing master, Sirio Pharrell. Likely Arya's dead, Cersei says, which everyone seems to assume um, that Arya is dead. Um, it's going to be pretty crazy when Arya just walks back to Westeros one day and says, Yeah, uh, I've actually been alive the whole time. Uh, reports of my demise were were exaggerated. I'm in fact quite alive. Well, how alive is she? She's sort of damaged goods in some ways, isn't she, Arya? Poor, poor Arya. Um, next page. So they talk about the people on the small council and how they're untrustworthy. Uh, Varys and Littlefinger and, and, and Janos Slint are hardly trustworthy people. Um, and Tyrion... Tyrion says that Joffrey's short reign has been a long parade of follies and disasters. Man, Tyrion, you don't know the half of it. Things are going to get a lot wackier quite quite soon. Um, and, and indeed, even wackier after Joffrey dies and Cersei becomes Queen Regent. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good point, David, in the chat, that there's the fake Arya, Jane Poole. Uh, so, yeah, officially speaking, Arya is supposedly alive again, uh, even though she's... Uh, actually a different Arya. God, these are complicated books, aren't they? Are there many book series more complicated than Game of Thrones? There can't be many, or at least popular ones. There can't be very many popular book series anywhere near as complicated as Game of Thrones. I know I know, Wheel of Time is a lot uh, longer, uh, and it's certainly complex, though I, I feel... I, I haven't read it, I confess, but I understand that it's more of a... Uh, dare I say, like, generic fantasy sort of thing, which might not have as many complexities as Game of Thrones in terms of, like, secret identities and conspiracies and, like, prophecies and possibilities and mysteries. Uh, but, but, yeah, I don't know. I'd be interested to know if there's anything more complicated. Um, uh, Muhammad wants a boxing match with Alt Shift X. Alt Shift X has a fucking mean right hook, mate. I would not... I mean, his left hook is trashed, though. He actually hasn't got a left hand. Uh, Dammit Dagnet says that Animorphs is more complicated. True, that goes without saying. Animorphs is the most complex, deep, sophisticated literary work of our era, um, and we will have to do more Animorphs abridged soon. Uh, Yakimoz says that Shades of Grey is pretty complicated. If man, if there weren't 
uh, if there weren't copyright holding me back, there would be a, a full Shades of Grey audiobook slash abridgment slash commentary series on, on Alt Shift XXX. Man, that would be there. Smash Davo says Star Wars Old EU. Yeah, there is a lot going on in some of the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Um, although, I'm going to be honest, some of it's trash. Yusang Vong can fuck right off. There, I said it. Uh, Deepak says that June is uh, complicated. Um, yeah, uh, don't, don't tell anyone, but I also haven't read June. <laughs> I really want to read June. Uh, David says that the Silmarillion is complicated. Yeah, it's just because of all the fucking elves with the same names. If you think that Game of Thrones is con confusing with like 15 characters called Aegon, the Silmarillion is even more fucked. Um, just, look, just look at those like Hobbit family trees in the appendix of the Lord of the Rings, actually. My god. My god. Um... Yeah, Deepak says that Dune has a lot of, like, profound ideas in it. Yeah, I, I, Dune, I, I, like, I think one of the reasons why Dune appeals to me is that it sounds like a story that's driven by ideas rather than driven by, like, you know, swords or even, like, characters. Um, Westworld, I think one of the, I think, like, Westworld, there, there's a lot of bad things about Westworld, but I think one of the good things about Westworld is that in many ways it's a story that's driven by ideas and ideals, like the beliefs and 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 the and the perspectives and the ideas of people like uh, Robert Ford uh, and Arnold Weber are what drive the story of Westworld, and I think it's really refreshing and exciting to see a war of ideas as opposed to a war of strength or even a, a war of of character. I think sometimes idea based stories can be exciting. Anyway, um, so they talk about the politics. Um, and they talk about how much of a bad ruler Joffrey is, uh, and Tyrion comments that crowns do queer things to the heads beneath them, uh, and never a truer thing has been said, I think. Power corrupts, they say, uh, and crowns are quite power e. <clears throat> uh, Cersei mentions that part of the reason why Joffrey uh, executed Eddard Stark was to give the mob a better show, which I think is an interesting way to frame that. I mean, maybe it's just a little minor thing, but but I wonder, you could do some thinking about like how Joffrey feels about his public image. One of the things that the show sort of had a moment emphasizing was like there's a moment where Marjorie Tyrell takes Joffrey out to the balcony of the Sept of Baelor and they like wave to the crowds and Joffrey clearly clearly has a moment where he's like where he's like enjoying the adoration of the crowds um I'd I wonder in Joffrey's twisted little head how he feels about how he wants to be seen how he wants to look and so on um another thing they had in the show was that they have <laughs> they have a statue of King Joffrey with his crossbow put up somewhere in King's Landing, uh, which is kind of interesting. That there is evidence, I think, that 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 little Joffleberry, um, he sort of wants to be loved um, by the people deep down, but he doesn't do a great job uh, of uh, of of uh, achieving that. Um, Emily asks what happened in the first thirty minutes of this episode. Basically, Tyrion walked through a door. Uh, and then he had a chat with the small council, and he's trying to assert his power. Um, and he, we have some reminders about what's happened in the story thus far. Um, and the small council seems a doomed position, but Tyrion is stepping into it. And we're having a DNM with Cersei and Tyrion now. Um, and uh, Cersei's mad about her power being ignored once again. Uh, and yeah, his grace has an, has a unique way of winning the hearts of his subjects, Tyrion comments. Um, and they talk about the dismissal of Barristan Selmy, which was a spectacularly bad idea, which was suggested by Varys. Varys was the one who suggested they dismiss Barristan Selmy, which of course is presumably partly motivated by Varys' desire to take Barristan and use him as his own asset. That's something that Varys does a lot. He pockets useful and important and interesting people to use them later. Uh, that's what he tries to do with Ned Stark. Uh, Varys's plan was for Ned to, um, to take the black and go up to the wall, and many people speculate that uh, maybe Tyr maybe Varys would have grabbed Ned, nabbed Ned, and used him later. A better example maybe is Tyrek Lannister. Uh, Tyrek Lannister is sort of a Lannister 
cousin who's somewhere in the line of succession to Castle Rock, who suspiciously disappears in the middle of the riot of King's Landing. Um, uh, and many people suspect that Varys might have grabbed Tyrek to use him later. Um, but And of course, Tyrion is, is one of the others. Oh, well, well, yeah, Jorah is sort of one of these people. But, but Tyrion is, is someone who who uh, Varys sort of pockets by saving him from his execution and then sending him east. Varys is constantly looking out for useful people and then ferreting them, ferreting them off east to be used in his own schemes. And I think Varys is an example of this. Uh, Joffrey's fondness of Sandor Clegane is mentioned. I think Joffrey is desperate for a father figure in his life and Sandor uh, is that person. Sandor, like, for all his unapproachability, is quite a hit with the kids, really, isn't he? Um, because not only is Joffrey a big fan of Sandor, uh, but Sansa is a big fan of Sandor in her own funny little way. Um, I wonder why Sandor is so appealing to, to so many people. I want, maybe it's because he stands out as being different. Um, he's someone who, 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 or maybe, maybe it's sort of like a, uh, is this the right example? Maybe it's like a sort of like a Fonzie sort of a, like, I'm the cool outsider rebel, man. Like Sandor's like the cool uncle. Like he's the, like he's the guy who'll like, you know, sneak you some discount fireworks and a, and a, and a, and a bottle of goon when, when, you know, your parents, you know, like, like, like he's the cool uncle who's, who's a bit of a loose cannon and he'll help you out and let you have a ride on his quad bike down at the paddocks, you know, like he's a cool uncle. And maybe that's why Sandor is, um, so appealing. Dogpa, Jedi Master calls him. Maybe Sandor is indeed a bit of a dogpa to, um, them. Um, so... Uh, we talk about how Genos is a bit incompetent, um, n- not as not as competent as might be wished, uh, is Cersei's wording. Which, funnily enough, is, is what it said on my on my uh, on my on my report card in grade school. Um, under um, uh, yeah, not as not as competent as might be wished. And then they talk about how much of a bad idea it is to kick Barrison out of the Kingsguard because Barrison is like this famous warrior who everyone loves. He's a he's a man of the people. He's like uh he's like uh George Clooney. He's like George Clooney because George George Clooney he uh, he's he's an older gentleman who is widely loved for his acting and for all of his um, all of his charitable activities and he's just handsome as all fuck. Uh, everyone respects Clooney. He's like an aging, respectable gentleman. He's like the only actor who hasn't been hashtag me too'd, you know. Um, and Barrison is similar. He's someone who just sort of everyone loves and respects. Um, and uh, and it's just dumb to kick him out of your uh, camp. Um, and Gibbon enjoyed the Australian idiom bottle of goon, which strictly speaking is completely incorrect. Goon doesn't come in a bottle, it comes in a sack. Uh, goon sack is the term. Uh, so apologies if I misspoke. Um, David reckons that he's more like Patrick Stewart. They're both knights. That's, that is a good point. Um, and they probably have more comparable amounts of hair. Um... If George Clooney was a great Batman, uh, Muhammad says. Yeah, imagine if George Clooney was like a cricket player, uh, like a star cricket player. Um, actually, there are a lot of there are a lot of places in the world. Actually, yeah, that probably would be a better comparison. There are a lot of countries, uh, a lot of places, a lot of people, a lot of sports people, like sports stars who are like absolute heroes in their home countries. Uh, like a lot of football players and a lot of like cricket players in like in, in around like India and Sri Lanka and stuff. There are lots of sportsmen who are widely um, celebrated and loved, and some of them occasionally get elected as like uh, prime ministers and things. There are I, I can't name anyone, but I'm sure someone can tell me. There are examples of like great cricketers and stuff uh, who have become like politicians just because everyone loves them. And maybe that's a better comparison to the sort of person Barristan is in Westeros. Um, and they talk about how to manage Joffrey. Tyrion and Cersei talk about how are we going to keep... <coughs> oh, there's another burp for you. How are we going to keep Joffrey in line? Uh, and Tyrion says that, well, I could keep him in, our, in, on, in under line by uh, threatening him. Uh, because I can... Uh, and Cersei's like, well, I could... You know, he doesn't listen to me. Why would he listen to you if he doesn't listen to me? Um, and And Tyrion's like, well, here's the difference. Joffrey knows that you, Cersei, would never hurt him. But I might. 
And so Cersei's immediately like horrified, like Jesus Christ, like what are you suggesting you'll hurt my child? I'll 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 destroy you if you hurt my child. I'll put you in a barrel and it won't be like that cute scene in, in, in The Hobbit. I will fill it with concrete and I'll put you at the bottom of fucking the black water and they'll never see you or say your name again. You're gonna disappear if you hurt my child, is what Cersei says. Um but Tyrion's like, you, you're missing the point, mate. I'm not saying that I actually would hurt Joffrey. I'm saying that Joffrey might think that I would actually hurt Joffrey, and therefore he might listen to me. That's the idea. Because, um, yeah, J- Tyrion doesn't really want to hurt Joffrey particularly, uh, but he sort of suggests that he does enough that Cersei becomes very paranoid um, about that. Uh, Eskimo Cheese... Uh, says they're using power tools while listening to this. Um, I recommend an angle grinder in each hand and a nail gun in the in the mouth. So just like operate the nail gun with with your teeth. Um, it's really efficient. Um, cool. Uh, N. Gibbon asks whether Tyrion makes a comment about Cersei's cheekbones in the book. In the show, there's this great line where Tyrion's like, Ah, Cersei, well, you might be an absolute uh, despicable human being in every respect, but you do have pretty great cheekbones. You love your children, and you have great cheekbones. Those are your redeeming qualities. And no, Tyrion does not say this in the book. There are some good lines uh, invented for the show that aren't in the books. Um, but I don't know. That I, I, I don't think there are as many of them in the later seasons. I don't know why. Um, and so they're talking about Joffrey. Uh, Tyrion makes another reference to how he is small. And Tyrion and Cersei. Cersei is like, all right, all right, all right, fine. I will tolerate having you here as Anna the King, but you've got to be honest. You've got to listen to me. You've got to share your plans and intentions with me. No more secrets between us. Cersei says, which is so hilarious, <laughs> because for the rest, for the re- for the next, like, three books, they are constantly keeping secrets from each other, they are constantly plotting around each other. Like, I mean, it's not so long from now that Tyrion poisons Cersei to try to keep her out of action for a little bit, temporarily. I mean, he doesn't kill her, but he, but he makes her sick for a bit. Um, so we have this moment of, we are gonna be such good buddies, you and me, uh, and it's all downhill from there. Uh, Morlin asks whether the chaos is a ladder line from Littlefinger is in the books, and I don't believe it is, no. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, Tyrion's like, absolutely, I am yours, sister. I will not lie to you anymore, and Tyrion knows that he is lying. Uh, and so they're like, okay, since there are no more secrets between us, uh, Tyrion asks who murdered Jon Arryn, and Cersei says she doesn't know. Uh, and Tyrion, of course, wants to know because he was accused of the murder of Jon Arryn by Lysa Arryn, when, of course, it was Lysa Arryn who killed Jon Arryn under the orders of Littlefinger. Uh, and uh, Tyrion also brings up the fact that uh, Cersei has sex with Jaime. Uh, are you as blind? Uh, do you think I was as blind as our father, Tyrion says? Because he knows what's up between the twins and their twin cest. Uh, and Cersei slaps Tyrion. And then, Sir, and then Tyrion says, well, I don't think it's quite fair that you open your legs for one brother and not for another. And then Tyrion slaps, uh, and then Cersei slaps Tyrion again. And then Tyrion says, I never understood what Jaime saw in you apart from his own reflection. And then Cersei slaps Tyrion again. So, like, you gotta admit that Tyrion, he sort of, he sort of, he doesn't do himself any favours. He doesn't make it easy to get along with Cersei. Um, like, Cersei... Cersei's not the easiest person to get along with, but Tyrion does not make things easy. I think that, like, if Tyrion thinks that he's a better person than Cersei, if Tyrion wants to be smarter and and more practical and get shit done, I think he should be the better man and, like, not provoke Cersei so much like this. But he does it anyway, and so I think Tyrion causes his own um, problems for himself by aggravating Cersei so much. It's a bad idea. Um... Uh, so that's a bad. Uh, like what you know, you know, because uh, like, because like, what does he think is gonna happen? What does he think is gonna happen if he says, "Cersei, haha, you fuck your brother," and then he says, "Oh, you should fuck me." Uh, you're you're a bloody narcissist. What what does he think is gonna happen? Of course, Cersei's gonna bloody slap him. Uh, there's a great there's a great song that, that goes something something about uh, you 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 burnt you burnt my house down and got mad at my reaction. 
what you can't get mad at someone for their reaction to a bad thing that you do to them. And so I don't think Tyrion should get mad at what he's saying. Um, but on the other hand, he does deliver some pretty sick burns. Um, and Tyrion raises, raises the question of King Robert. Uh, Tyrion asks how Cersei killed King Robert, and Cersei says, well, actually, Robert pretty much did it to himself. Like, yes, we gave him the wine, and yes, we wanted him to die, but it was Robert's choice to drink the fortified wine, and it was Robert's choice to go after that boar, which ended up killing him. Which is true. Like, like, it, like there, there is a difference. Like, Cersei did not directly kill Robert Baratheon, really. Um, she certainly probably would have if she needed to, but but the way Robert died was partly of Robert's own doing. So it's it's not as simple as Cersei straight up being a murder of Robert, although she certainly would have been. Um, Rhaegar points out that Tyrion, by provoking Cersei in this way, is trying to show that he's not afraid of her, which, yeah, I think is a good point. He, he really is trying to assert his power and his authority here, and just in the same way that he was, like, glancing at these Valyrian sphinxes before to try and look confident and unconcerned, yeah, I think that's what he's trying to do here. Um, but I think it certainly backfires, at least in the sense that it just provokes Cersei, which causes more problems for him later. Um, Hassan suggests that the term assisted suicide might be a good description of Robert Baratheon's death, which, yeah, I think that's a good point. May may maybe there's a bit of the old, uh, what is it, the death drive uh, in, uh, in Robert Baratheon's actions. Maybe Robert was deliberately self-destructing to some extent. And of course there's the role of, uh, what's his name, the Lannister Lancel. Uh, he was the one who fed Robert the wine. So, and, and you know, there's the boar. Maybe in the same way that that elephant got hanged, we should we, we should hang the boar. Yeah, like Muhammad says. We should hang the boar for the crime of, of killing the king. Um, hanged until dead. Um, so, there are many culprits in the death of Robert, including Robert, the boar, Cersei, and Lancel. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. Um, oh, and then we get a food description. Are you ready? Food description! Uh, we we're describing what happens to the boar who killed Robert. Apparently they cooked and ate it later. Um, which, by the way, is in my will. It, it's part of my will that um, whoever slays Old Swift X, um, uh, they get... They, 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 no, my, my firstborn gets all of my possessions and wealth, but only if they uh, slay and eat my murderer uh, with mushrooms and apples, just like the boar in this book. Uh, that's the idea. Isn't there, isn't there that bit in Parks and Recreation where Ron Swanson describes his um, his will, and, it, and it's about like giving all of his earthly possessions to the man or beast who, mur who, who murders him? <laughs> I think that's how it works. Uh, but but all right, so we've got a food description here, and the recipe is, if you want if you want to make this recipe at home, uh, the first ingredient for this recipe is a is a king slaying boar, a, a big old hairy pigo, big old hairy pig dog with the old tuscaroos, uh, nice and braised and and glazed and tasted. Well, that's that's what you want. Ingredient one. Ingredient two: mushrooms, little shroom dogs, little shroomishes, rare Pokemons. They grow down little little down little near the oak roots. Don't get any. Funny shrooms, or you'll go on a vision quest with a Sasquatch. Apples! Crispy Granny Smith. Tasty Red Delicious. Whatever kind of apple you prefer, it's a matter of taste. Little globules of vitamin and, and glorious... Ah, oh, crisp apples. Love them. That's ingredient three. But ingredient four, that Cersei says, is triumph. Cersei says that the boar tasted like triumph because uh because Cersei has long wanted Robert dead and this boar was the vehicle of her long awaited uh satisfaction in the death of her gross husband uh so those four ingredients combine uh leave overnight preheat your oven um add a add a generous swig of fortified wine and you will enjoy a delicious meal <coughs> Um, and Tyrion mentions that he liked Robert Baratheon, but only because Cersei hated him. Uh, and then they start to leave, and then Cersei's like, yo, you, 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 you haven't delivered the one thing that I wanted, which is some kind of plan to free my twin brother Jaime. And then Tyrion says, well, I'll let you know when I've got a plan. Schemes are like fruit. 
they require a certain ripening. And then we have another mention of the Sphinx beside the door. What is the significance of the Sphinx? Is it about riddles? Is it about weird hybrids? I mean, Tyrion, in a sense, is a weird hybrid, because Tyrion is a combination of, like, the Targaryen features, and, like, I mean, you know, he's, he's got the blonde hair and whatever, and he's got the... But, but, but well, most importantly, he's got two different coloured eyes he has like a blue eye and a green eye or something so uh, and and there's something weird about the the the, the dwarfism i think so so there's there's a sort of a hybridness and a and a and a and a, a weirdness to Tyrion's body which is maybe reflected in the sphinx is what i'm trying to say um and then Tyrion walks out of the room he nods to sir mandon who he had asserted his power over before um and he asks where Timot, son of Timot, is, to Bronn, his two bodyguards, Bronn and Timot. Timot has wandered off, uh, and Bronn said that, well, Timot wandered off because he has an urge to explore. His kind was not made for wait- waiting about in halls. Uh, and Tyrion says, well, I hope he doesn't murder anyone important. Um, which which is funny, but I, 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 whenever that sort of stuff happens, I always think it's it is interesting the way, like, it's totally I mean not to get not to get all preachy. I think it's interesting that like it's considered totally like socially a okay to joke about murder and people being killed. I mean this is a very low level example. There's lots of time when death and violence is used in popular culture just for, like for laughs. And I think it's funny how like we think that's okay when there are other sorts of crimes which is considered totally like not okay to like make light of. Um, and to make fun of, like, it, it seemed, it's, 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 it's looked at as, like, um, delegitimizing or, like, disrespecting or, like, um, or, like, minimizing the, the, the weight and importance of an issue to, to laugh about it. And so I think it's funny that, like, murder and violence, which are surely some of the most capital bad crimes, our society just think it's, like, A-OK to joke about. I don't know what the answer is there, but I don't know. That's just something that sticks out to me. Uh, thank you kindly for the donation from Tribute to Trivium, who asks, are the, Val- are the Valyrian Sphinxes involved in the conspiracy to put Sir Pounce on the Iron Throne? Yeah, I mean, maybe the Valyrian Sphinxes... I mean, when Sir Pounce, when noble Sir Pounce and his companions, Boots and Lady Whiskers, when they are striding the halls of the Red Keep at night, going about their feline business, plotting the installation of the rightful king, Sir Pounce, to the Iron Throne. I wonder if they stop and look up at the great carved Valyrian sphinxes, just as a just as a regular tabby cat in Egypt might look up at the carved great catos of of the of the pyramidos at Giza. I wonder if they look up at the Valyrian sphinxes and say this is who we aspire to be. These are the role models. They are the gods of cats. And we aspire to be as great as these stone felines in the sky. I wonder what kind of inspiration those sphinxes are. Um, Swift, uh, uh, George uh, George in the chat asks whether uh, Alt, Alt Shifedex, whoever he is, will do more Westworld. Um, yeah, I, I expect there will be more Westworld content from Alt Shift X. Um, I don't know if Shift is going to do like weekly episode breakdowns for each episode, uh, but I think what will at least happen is like weekly uh, live streams immediately after each Westworld episode. Uh, they just sort of respond to the episode, talk about some of the theories, try to do some analysis. I think that is um, what will likely happen on Alt Shift X, depending on how keen people are, basically. Um... Hassan says that Valyrian sphinxes don't have cats in their structure. What animals are they made up of then? Is it like a, a, a bird or something? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, anyway. Um, so, we have a recipe for tasty boar. We have schemes are like fruit. We have Timot wandering off. Uh, and we have some instructions of uh, how to house the Tyrion's clansmen from the Mount of the Moon uh, because uh, because all the different clans, like the Moon Brothers and the Burned Men and the Stone Crows, will probably start to kill each other uh, if you have them uh, hanging out too close together. So uh, Tyrion gives very specific instructions on how to keep them separate. Um, all right, we've got to speed up a little bit because uh, there's... There's only so much, so many hours in the day. Um, so, uh, so Tyrion decides to go to the Broken Anvil, 
uh, and Bronn offers to escort him, uh, but Tyrion decides to go with the Lannister guards instead to take them as his guard because Tyrion wants to remind the Lannister guards that Tyrion is as much a Lannister as Cersei is, uh, and he wants the guards to recall that their oath is to Castly Rock, not to Cersei. So this is a smart way that Tyrion is trying to assert his power, remind people of his authority as a Lannister. Um, so that's cool. Um, and they're walking by, and Tyrion notices some heads on spikes that are rotting, uh, presumably the heads of Ned Stark and the, um, and the nun lady, what's her name, Scepter, Scepter, Scepter M- Mordain, Who's, which one, which Scepter? I don't know. So, 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 so a bunch of the people who, uh, were killed in the purging of Starks from the Red Keep, and Tyrion thinks, well, I think we should take those heads down, because it's a bit gross, it sort of clashes with the drapes, it's not good for, for the vibes, man. Um, and so Tyrion wants to take these heads down off the spikes, uh, because, Tyrion says, even in the midst of war, certain decencies need to be observed. Which you can sort of look at in a bunch of different ways. Like, are these sorts of moments of humanity and compassion and, yeah, Mordain, are these moments of humanity and compassion in the midst of war and horror and dehumanization, is that a good thing? Is that something that reaffirms our humanity in the face of horror? Or... Uh, is it something that, like, gives lip service to humanity and compassion? It allows us to pretend that we're still good people, because, oh, look, we might be slaughtering people in war, but at least we're decent enough to take the heads down after a while. Like, like really? Is that a really a meaningful positive measure, or is that just a way of making us feel like we're good guys even, we're doing, even when we're doing bad things? Is it meaningful to, to have those little moments of humanity, or is it futile and 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 dishonest to do that i don't know i suppose that's one of the central questions of game of thrones like in the midst of horror and war and awfulness what what is the meaning of 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 the little moments of goodness that we can achieve and maybe george martin would say everything it's it's all we've got um but i don't know i i think we live in a better world than Westeros, and I think we can have higher standards. I don't think in the real world we should settle for little symbolic moments of humanity. I think we should aim for a world that truly is a good place for people. But here's me fucking proselytizing again. I just got this wacky idea that we should be you know, g- good. Um, so, so um, uh, Tyrion tries to assert his authority over Vila, this 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 Captain Vila and the Lannister soldiers, um, and he threatens Vila until he agrees to take down the heads. Um, and Tyrion walks through the city and he notices that things are looking bad. Um, the, there's not a lot of food around. There's a lot of presence of the gold cloaks to keep everything in order. Tyrion sees a naked corpse in a gutter being torn at by feral dogs and no one seems to care. So things are pretty, things are pretty grim in King's Landing. Things are going badly and they will, uh, (laughs) spoiler, only get worse. Someone's selling fresh rats. A street vendor is going around shouting, fresh rats, fresh rats, cockles and clams. Um, so things are pretty grim. Uh, but they're not down to eating the bootstraps yet, like Stannis was in Storm's End. Um, so, or Dragonstone? Storm's End. I, mm-hmm. um, and so Tyrion talks about how bad the situation is, uh, and Vilar describes some of the measures that Cersei has taken to prepare for war. She's been uh, uh, sending stonemasons to strengthen the walls, carpenters building scorpions and catapults. Of course, Cersei in Season 7 later builds a scorpion to kill a dragon. And Cersei has also... Uh, commissioned a whole bunch of wildfire to be produced, uh, which is later used in the war. Um, and Tyrion is kind of concerned about Cersei having wildfire, um, because, uh, 10,000 jars that Cersei is making is enough to turn all of King's Landing into cinders. Do you think that might be a little bit of a shadowing? The fact that Cersei has a whole bunch of wildfire that could burn down the city? It, It is, it is really weird that, um... That Cersei in the show only burned down the Sept and not the whole city, uh, and like, because like you know maybe Cersei could burn down the whole city later in the show, but like they've kind of blown their wad with the Great Sept thing, right? So like maybe the burning of King's Landing will happen like uh, caused by Daenerys's dragons in the show, like maybe that's what will happen. But I don't know. I feel like there should only be one moment of 
oh no, King's Landing is burning down, burning down, burning down. Uh, I feel like there should only be one moment of that, you know? And so it seems weird to me that they just sort of half did it by burning down the Sept in the show. Budget reasons, Rega suggests. Well, surely, surely a whole bunch of CGI fire and a few, like, wide shots of King's Landing, surely that would be doable. Like, would, would it even be that much harder to do a burning of the King's Landing city instead of just the Sept? I, I, I don't know. I don't know how... I don't know how CGI wildfire works, but it seems doable. I don't know. I just wish they had money for Ghost. <laughs> Why isn't Ghost a thing? Um, so, uh, uh, Rasheen reckons that the ice dragon will burn it down. D does an ice dragon burn, or does it, like, freeze? Like, just turn King's Landing into some sort of, like, Club Penguin f Disney Frozen utopia? That might be nice. Maybe that'll improve the situation. Uh, Mahabad reckons that the burning... Uh, of the Sept of Baylor was excellent in the show. I thought that was one of the most enjoyable parts of season six was the burning. I loved the way they used the soundtrack. I loved the way they raised the tension. Um, I feel like the, the deaths and the horror that happened really felt like they had some impact and was really cool. I, I agree that there was cool stuff about that scene, but I, I don't know. I feel like it's just, it's just a bit weird that King's Landing's still standing, given all the foreshadowing that it will burn. Um, anyway, so... Uh, so Tyrion asks what Cersei's doing about the financial situation, uh, and Valar says that Littlefinger suggested a tax, uh, on all new people entering the city, and Tyrion realises, ah, that's very clever and very cruel, uh, because there are tens of thousands of people fleeing the warfare that's happening in, like, the Riverlands and around Westeros who are coming to the city for protection, and for solace and for refuge in this time of war and upheaval. And so Littlefinger charging a heavy tax on people entering the city um, is going to bring on a bunch of money because there are desperate people who will give anything to come into the safety of King's Landing. So it's quite exploitative of Littlefinger to tax the refugees. You know, that'd be like, you know, Syrian refugee crisis. Sure, come in, survive, but like, we're going to take your kidneys. Like, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit cruel to take from the most vulnerable people. I would think. Let's turn a page. Uh, so, yeah, war is a bitch. Um, and... Uh, so Tyrion stops at a courtyard, and a boy runs out to grab Tyrion's horse and offers to look after the horse, which is something that happens all the time. Which, by the way, like, how... Like, wouldn't these, like, street children and or, like, these random, like, stable boys and stuff who were just looking after everyone's horses and everyone just trusts these boys to take their horses, wouldn't these boys just steal the horses a bunch? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, D David in the chat points out that John does uh, a very similar thing uh, to that tax because uh, John takes all of the wildlings' treasures when they enter uh, King's... Uh, when they enter the Wall. Uh, when when they are refugees fleeing the White Walkers and John takes their shit, uh, I suppose there might be like a bit of a difference in that like uh, John is offering like uh, food and safety and support to those wildlings in a way that the peasants coming to King's Landing maybe are not. Like a lot of those peasants, if they give up all their money, they're not going to have money to buy food, right? Whereas like what John took from the wildlings was like treasures and horns and like literal dildos who which probably aren't like all that essential for life i would think so i don't know maybe there's a slight difference but but i mean yeah yeah it's it's very similar and a bit and a good point i think um uh righty so um so the horse is taken um and uh and Tyrion dismisses the guards uh and Tyrion enters uh enters this uh, hotel, brothel, saloon sort of establishment, uh, and he hears the laughter of Shella, son of Chaik, uh, and of Shay, because of course what, what Tyrion has really come here for is for Shay, uh, his, his lady love. Um, and Shay is having a good time with Shella, son of Chaik, who I, I think would go off at a party. Um, Chelison of Chaik is talked about a bit. She, she barely appears in the show. Chelison of Chaik gets, like, like, two seconds screen time. Um, she does, she does look quite good, actually, though, I think, in the show. Her costume with the ears and just her general demeanor is quite appropriate in the show, I think. Um, and so they're all hanging out, um, and Tyrion notices to his, uh, to his 
surprise and and not to his gladness uh, that that Varus is here hanging out with Shay and Chella, uh, which is quite an odd. It's quite an odd bunch of people, actually, isn't it? An eighteen-year-old uh, prostitute Shay, a hardened warrior woman of the mountain clans and the eunuch master of whisperers of king's landing that is quite an odd that is quite a motley crew uh having a drink together i'd love to hear their conversation um but Tyrion rocks up and they and they chat and uh quite a bunch of interesting politics happens in this conversation because just in the same way that Tyrion has spent most of this chapter trying to assert his authority and demonstrate his power over the people around him, Varys is taking a moment to do that to Tyrion. And like, I don't know, maybe to some extent it's Tyrion's paranoia, but Varys is definitely sending a message here. Um, because uh, T- uh, Varys basically is saying that, like, um, Varys is turning up at Shay. Uh, and showing Tyrion that Varys knows where Shay is, even though Tyrion has tried to hide Shay. So Varys is demonstrating that I know um, your secrets, Tyrion. Um, and um, and Varys makes a weird comment about how on the gatehouse nearby there are these carved eyes on the gate. Um, and Varys thinks that, oh, quite remarkable, you know, eyes, don't you think? And then Tyrion interprets that as meaning that Varys is actually alluding to his spies um, that he has everywhere, which is how Varys learned about where Shay is. So Tyrion's reminding, so Varys is reminding Tyrion of his of his spy and his, his ability to know things. Um, and Varys also warns Shay that, oh, you know, there's a lot of dangerous people out in the city at night, lots of bad men with cold steel and colder hearts, uh, which Tyrion interprets as Varys's way of saying that I can assassinate you and, and your woman any time, man, Tyrion. Um, and, and then Tyrion's response is that, well, you know, I, I've got dangerous men too who can look after my people, like Chela son of Chaik, uh, which Tyrion means uh, means as a threat against Varys. So we have this whole conversation that, that says one thing, but there's subtext that means another. Uh, so this is basically Varys and Tyrion uh, contending uh, and um, making mutual threats against each other. Um, and basically, Shay is a pawn in the middle of this game. Shay, this poor innocent eighteen-year-old girl who has been dragged into the bed of this rich, uh, privileged Tyrion Lannister, uh, and who honestly has no choice but to go along with um, being uh, his uh, bedmate, uh, is is right at the center of this whole dangerous game. And you know, she she is clever. I think it's clear. I mean, at least for an eighteen-year-old, she's she's smart. Um, but but she's in she's involved in a game that's above her head and which ultimately destroys her because of course later on Shay gets threatened by Cersei and ends up um betraying uh Tyrion and then gets murdered by Tyrion and I think there's a long complicated conversation to have about you know what Shay's real feelings were what Shay's situation was whether Shay is innocent or guilty I I tend to think um an 18 year old kid can hardly be blamed for being dragged into this situation. She really had very few choices. Like when when someone as powerful and rich as Tyrion Lannister uh, demands your presence in his bed, you can't exactly say no. There was no real point where she could have said no. If you want to talk about bloody workplace (laughs) harassment, hashtag me too. Let's not, I mean, let's not preach again, but like, yeah, Shay Shay does not have a pleasant time in this series, I think. Uh, although you know, to some extent, to some extent, it does seem to be true that Shay does love Tyrion in at least some sense. I mean, she's she's clearly she has no choice to some extent, but I think I think it is fairly clear that to some extent, Sansa, that Shay does love uh, Tyrion. So I mean, at, at least there's that. Uh, but I do I do tend to think that she's um, something of a victim in this story. I think. Um, so, yeah, so we also have a bit of banter among Chella, son of Cheik, who's talking about how she collects ears from the people who she kills or who she beats in battle. Uh, because uh, Chella, when she beats someone in battle, she decides to let them let the man live, but to take his ear um, because she thinks that that's a braver, more honorable thing to do um, because it gives the man she defeated a chance to maybe try and beat her later on and win his ear back, which is which is cool. Um, but Tyrion's like, man, I, I'm terrified of my enemies. 
so I kill them all. Tyrion, as a coward, decides to kill his enemies so his enemies never get a chance to strike back against him. And I'm going to be honest, I am with Tyrion on this one. Honor is for suckers. I'm not risking my life so that some wanker with a knife can jump me at the last minute and take all of my ears. Um... And uh, and then Varus, on his way out, drops a tasty riddle. Varus says, Here's a riddle about power, Tyrion. In a room, there are three great men, a king, a priest, and a rich man with gold. And between them stands a sellsword, uh, just some random guy with a sword. And each of the powerful men uh, tells the sellsword to kill the other two men. The king says... Kill the priest and the rich man, uh, because I am your lawful ruler, the king. And the priest says, no, kill the king uh, and and the rich man, because I command you with the names of the gods. And then the rich man says, no, no, kill the king and the priest, because I will give you all of this gold. And so the question Varus asks is, well, who lives and who dies? Um, And so it's a question about, like, how does power work? What, What is the source of power? Does power come from political authority, like the king? Does power come from uh, religious authority, from the priest? Does, does does power come from wealth? Or perhaps does power come from the sword that the cell sword wields? Is power ultimately just about pure physical force? And, you know, I don't think there's meant to be a straight answer. Um, like Tyrion, Tyrion's immediate response to the, to the riddle is, well, it would depend on the cell sword, because I guess the cell sword in this situation wields the most immediate natural power, so it's sort of up to him to decide which of these authorities is the most significant. But, but I mean, I mean, there's there's no answer to this riddle, and I think that the whole series is in some ways a meditation on this question: what kinds of power matter, matter most? I reckon you could add to this list of great men. You could add like a sorcerer or something, because one of the other kinds of power that um, one of the other kinds of power that Game of Thrones explores is magical power. People like Melisandre, Macquaro, Euron. Um, you could almost add a lover. You could add, um, you could, you could add the sellsword's lover saying, kill the other people because I love you and, 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 and the power of love to influence people's motivations, which is what we're seeing with Shay in this conversation right now. There are lots of different kinds of power. Um, and, and, and and yeah, what Varus does say later, as Mark says, is about how power resides where men believe it resides. And I guess that is to some extent the point of this riddle. Uh, Fabian points out that there's a connection here about how uh, we've just had the Sphinx appear twice in this chapter, and the Sphinx uh, represents uh, riddles in Greek mythology, dropping some mad riddle bombs on Oedipus. So maybe Varus is the Sphinx in this chapter, because Varus is posing a riddle just as the Sphinx does in mythology. So that's a cool uh, connection, I think. Um, And so they talk about power, and then finally, finally... After dealing with all of this politics, Tyrion gets to uh, uh, meet back up with his lady love, Shay, who he's been wanting to be with this whole time, who he is in love with despite all his reservations about Shay being a prostitute and not being quite sure if Shay genuinely loves him. Um, uh, Tyrion is insecure about a great many things in this chapter, his height, his power, and the love of the woman he sleeps with. Um, but Shay uh, puts out a, puts up a pretty convincing... Uh, a show of of genuinely being happy to see Tyrion um, and enjoying his company. Um, And they go up the stairs and they go to a room together. um, And Shay is living out in this uh, brothel or this hotel um, as like a way to hide Shay because uh, Lord Tywin uh, prohibited Tyrion from bringing Shay and would probably kill Shay if he knew that Shay was here. Um, So Tyrion must keep Shay as his little uh, secret um, and, uh, Shay apparently does not believe in small clothes and immediately, be- and immediately gets nude and they start getting it on, um, sex descriptions, of course, are like the equivalent of food descriptions a lot of the time in this series. Um, and, and Shay's teasing Tyrion saying like, oh, well, you know, since I have to hang out here and I don't get to hang out in your bed all the time, you're going to get really lonely staying in the Tower of the Hand. You won't be able to get to sleep when I'm not around if you get hard. Oh, is that why they call it the Tower of the Hand? So Shay is making a, uh, cheeky masturbation joke, which is fun. Oh, and Shay calls Tyrion my giant of Lannister when they're in bed. 
so it's revealing the extent of Tyrion's uh, insecurity about his height and his uh, and his desperation to be to fantasize about being a big strong man, which is part of what Tyrion's whole deal is about in this chapter and indeed in his broader arc. Um, and and when Tyrion enters Shay, she screams loud enough to wake Baelor the Blessed in his tomb, and her nails leave gouges in his back. Maybe it's possible that Shay's putting it on just a little bit. Uh, Emily Harper detects an erect pavilion, indeed. Um, so, yeah, we have Tyrion having, like, this moment of, like, oh, you know, Shay's a prostitute, she only loves your coin, she doesn't love you as a person, so he's t- uh, super skeptical and insecure and unsure, um, but at the same time, she sure seems to be enjoying this dwarf cock, uh, and then the chapter ends by, uh, Shay asking, so, you know, what are you gonna do now? You've rocked up, it's chapter one, what's your, what's on the agenda for the rest of this book, Tyrion? Um, and... Uh, Tyrion says, I'll do something that Cersei will never expect. I'll do justice. And as Stannis Baratheon once said, there is nothing half so terrifying as a truly just man. So that was a chapter. Tyrion won A Clash of Kings. I hope you enjoyed. There was a lot going on in this chapter. I thought this was a good introduction uh, to Tyrion's arc in A Clash of Kings. Uh, the main thing that was going on was it was reminding readers about what's going on in King's Landing with, you know, the the strife in King's Landing and Stannis and Renly preparing for war and, and the aftermath of the death of Eddard Stark and, 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 the, and, the, and the Lannisters holding the Starks hostage and all of that plot stuff. But we're also reminded of, like, what's going on with Tyrion's character and his goals in this book to try and assert himself and gain some power and prove himself at the same time juggling his relationship with Shay, which is of course a major source of conflict later on in the series that's his relationship with Cersei which is also a really large source of conflict in the series uh other interesting plot elements like the sellsword brawn and like the mountains of the moon um other other important elements like Littlefinger and Varys and and, and Tyrion's also got his sights set on Janos Slint um there's a whole lot going on in this chapter which continues to develop and grow and get exciting throughout the rest of this book so thank you all for listening to this episode I hope that you enjoyed um it is always fun and wonderful to speak uh Game of Thronesian nonsense uh to you all 118 people wouldn't it, it's 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 like imagining like a like a little like an auditorium. I'm imagining I'm imagining the venue that an alt drift X uh would would happen in. Um and uh and it's it's a lovely sight. So thank you all for participating. If you'd like to listen to a Clash of Kings abridged this show as a podcast, you can. Uh, there is a URL in the video description. You can plug that into any podcast player. Uh, and you can listen to this whole thing as an audio feed whenever you like. Uh, I don't think this episode will be up on on podcast until a little bit later. I think usually there'll there'll be some delay between um, the video live stream and the podcast feed, whatever. But yeah, um, oh, I'll tell you what we do need. We need. Um, I've been meaning to make a image. Um, that says like stream over thanks for watching at the end of a stream because like I feel like ending a stream it often feels like sort of abrupt when this when the stream just suddenly sort of ends so what I'll do real quick is just make up a little image that does that and I will put it into oh you probably heard that and I'll put um an image that says that into OBS so I can just have like a little sort of like a credits roll sort of a thing uh, while it uh, does that and it'll take a sec to do that uh, man this is so unprofessional but what people come for to old Drift X you know it's really about the professionalism I think uh, so this